Good morning again, everyone, and welcome to the informational session related to First 10 Community Schools. Really happy to see all of you today. For those of you who I may not have met before, I'm Leanne Larson and I direct the early learning team in Maine's Department of Education. And I'm joined this morning by David Jacobson from um, Education Development Center, EDC, who will be um, sharing information about the first 10 model with all of us. But to get things going, I just wanted to give a little bit of context around this um, work and opportunity. Um, some of you may be aware that the Department of Education received a preschool development grant back at the end of December that is um, a really wonderful opportunity for our state. We will be receiving $8 million a year for the next three years to build infrastructure related to um, our birth to age eight system in this state. And within our grant application, we identified a number of important areas that we really wanted to work on building stronger systems to help support children and families. And one of those areas is around the development of a pilot um, to help um, ideally six sites in our state be able to implement the first 10 model. We have some history with first 10 um, from work we did a few years ago um, from a previous federal grant that we had that was related to public pre-K expansion. And as David will talk a little bit about this morning, um, we were able to get um, some models started across 13 school systems in the state. Unfortunately, the pandemic did not help us <laughs> in this work um, because just as those were getting off the ground, we were experiencing a lot of challenges. And um, so one of the things we really wanna do in the preschool development grant is be able to jumpstart this work again. And so um, we thought that providing this informational session would be a good opportunity to build some background, um, hopefully interest uh, school systems in the state in being part of this work. And then um, later on in April or early May, the department will be releasing an RFA <clears throat> for those um, school systems who are interested in sending in an application to potentially be a part of the work. So I'm gonna let um, David take over and really build some background about First 10. And then when we get to the end, I'll talk a little bit more about what to potentially expect in that RFA um, and answer any questions that you might have. So David, all set? All set. Thank you so much, Leanne. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. As Leanne said, I'm David Jacobson. I'm here with several colleagues. We'll tell you more about us in a moment. Uh, I want to say from the outset that we are very excited about this initiative. We're going to be talking about the possibility of creating first 10 partnerships in your communities. These are school community partnerships focused on the first decade of children's lives, focused on young children and their families. As Leanne said, we worked in Maine several years ago with communities who did great work, and we're, we're excited to be back. Um, the, and, and Leanne and her colleagues, not only in the Department of Ed, but really across state agencies, are really very committed to supporting communities and developing these kinds of partnerships and, and creating local infrastructure to support young children and their families. So we're very excited to be collaborating with you uh, on this uh, initiative. Um, and I will also kind of hint and foreshadow that Maine has, we, we do this work in six different states, but Maine has built in some special Maine secret sauce uh, into this initiative, which we will tell you about. And we're really excited about the thoughtful way that uh, uh, your colleagues in state agencies have designed this initiatives, initiative and created some special components, which we think will benefit your communities um, all the more, all the more. So we're, we're really excited about that. Uh, so let's do some introductions. We're a small enough group, then, and then we'll, we can tell you uh, more about um, 
first 10, I'll share some slides with you and then would love, you know, to have your questions as we go. Let's make this uh, informal and interactive. Um, uh, but uh, if, if, if I think we're a small enough group, Leanne, I'll just kind of go through quickly and get a sense of where people are from. That's often uh, helpful uh, for, for us. So um, I'm going to follow the grid. Uh, so actually, let me first just uh, introduce my team. We have a, a number of members of First 10, and I'm going to ask them just uh, to, to wave. Um, Christy, Brianna, Mary, if you would just kind of let folks know who you are, they're sitting in and... Um, uh, uh, soaking up all the good main conversation. Uh, so thank you all uh, for being here. And uh, I'll just follow then on my screen. We'd just love to know where you're coming from. And I'll start with Steve. Good morning. My name is Steve Buzier. I am the assistant superintendent from the Sanford School Department, which is located in Southern Maine. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Steve and Carol. I'm Carol Kisman, and I'm the curriculum director at the um, Vassaboro Community School District in Vassaboro. Great. Oh, yes. Nice to see you. Uh, and Mary or Mary Alice? Hi, I'm the superintendent in RSU 71, which is Belfast and the four surrounding towns in the Midcoast. Great. Thank you so much. Peter. Hi, I'm Peter Karen, and I'm the coordinator of um, innovation and community outreach for the Valley Unified Education Service Center, which uh, comprises three uh, different school units uh, in the upper St. John Valley region of Arista County up along the Canadian border. Okay, great. Welcome. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Amanda and colleague. Hmm. Hi, my name is Amanda Belanger. I'm the principal at Woodland Elementary School in Baileyville. Hi, I'm Pat Mehta. I'm the current superintendent in Baileyville, um, and Mandy is going to be the superintendent next year. So that's why we're both on. All right. Fantastic. Uh, welcome all. What a great group. You are the perfect folks to be hearing this, and um, we're excited to uh, have this conversation with you. So with that, I'm going to share some slides with you. Um, and as I said, you know, stop me if you have any questions as we go. We're going to first, I'm going to share with you the first 10 model and the how it looks like when we implement it, what it looks like when we implement it. And then um, we'll also, uh, Leanne and I will be describing the specific opportunity that the, the, that the, the state of Maine is making available to your communities. So to begin, uh, we are from the Education Development Center, EDC. We are a mission-driven nonprofit organization focused on education, health, and expanding economic opportunity. Uh, we work in all 50 states and across the developing world. And as we do this first 10 work, we draw on the expertise of a number of colleagues, upwards of 80 colleagues uh, who have expertise in early childhood and elementary school education and care. And as you, as you begin to wrap your head around First 10, there are three big ideas to keep in mind. The first is that research supports a community-wide approach to the first 10 years. And here we're talking about bridging early childhood and K-12 education and bridging education, health, and social services. The second big idea is that innovative communities across the United States, both communities that we have studied through applied research, as well as the upwards of 50 communities where we have implemented our uh, first 10 and transition to kindergarten approaches, together have created or are creating a first 10 roadmap. And this roadmap addresses teaching and learning, partnerships with families and comprehensive services. So a lot of initiatives, as you know, focus on teaching and learning in classrooms. Others focus on family support. We really, our reading of the literature is that all three uh, are, are integrally important. And so we, those are all addressed through First 10. And third, the third big idea is that First 10 provides a framework, a planning process, and a set of strategies to guide local partnerships. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna give you some concrete examples of those strategies in practice. Uh, and by the way, um, Leanne has these slides and we'll be making them all available to you. Um, 
and we can make sure that we get your email addresses. Uh, Leanne, would it be helpful if folks put their email addresses in the chat? I actually have them all from the registration, David. So oh, okay. all set, oh, I can right. follow up easily afterward. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Okay, great. Uh, I always like to ground this work in the fundamental challenges of poverty. We uh, have a consensus in the United States that the best way to address the challenges of poverty is to start early. But how we do that is critically important. We know from the research that children need consistent quality uh, each and every year. No one year of high quality services is going to address the full challenges of poverty. So we need quality each and every year. We need alignment across the age span such that each year builds on the learning and care of the previous year and, um, and prepares children for the learning and care of the subsequent year. And so that alignment is really important, particularly as we think about the, the, the gap between early childhood and uh, K-12. And then we need coordination across education, health, and social services at each stage of development. However, we tend to have very fragmented local mix, what we call mixed delivery systems in the United States. And so what we mean by that is we have gaps between zero to five and K-12 education, gaps between education, health, and social services, and between public uh, or programs like schools and Head Start agencies and private community-based preschools. So let me pause there and ask, well, okay, I'll actually I'll push on for one more slide. The result of this fragmentation is that children experience inconsistent quality, gaps across the age span as they age, as they mature, and a lack of coordination across education, health, and social services. So let's go back to this slide now. And let me ask you, just in your experience as professionals, if you have um, come across, whether in your current role or a previous role, have you come across instances where you have felt that fragmentation, where you have experienced that fragmentation, where you have seen or thought to yourself, if only we had been a bit more aligned, if we had been coordinated more with the early childhood programs or with education, I mean, with uh, health and social service agencies, we could have done better by children and families. We could have served them better, it would have been in their best interest. Can you think of any examples in your careers where you have uh, bumped into that fragmentation and wish that we had been more coordinated or aligned? Is that our I believe us, every time aligned. we do pre-K screening, we find out how unaligned we are with the services that CDS is providing or not providing mm -hmm. um, to our students coming into pre-K. Um, and we have started working with Head Start in the last, I think, three years, it makes that we've been with Head Start, and that has helped the process. Uh -huh. um, but it's definitely fragmented between CDS and then the services that they get once the student enters kindergarten. Okay, so yes, the the services alignment, the alignment of services is a big gap that it sounds like you're experiencing. Thank you so much for that, Amanda. Um, and was somebody else starting to say something right there? Steve? I was just going to say, um, we have individual partnerships that we've formed with Head Start and with um, some early child care, care providers, but what happens is when when the per, when the people leave, the system mm. falls apart. Right, and so we try our best to coordinate, but we're noticing, especially now with the lack of services through CDS, the 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 turnover in staff internally and externally, that the the system is falling apart. Um, and that is exactly what the kind of thing. So thank you. Um, uh, th that builds, I think, on on what um, Amanda was saying. And so that really um, is consistent with our experience. It's what Le Leanne was talking about, about how these federal preschool development uh, B5 grants are intended to build those kinds of systems. And that's exactly the kind of work that we want to do through uh, First 10 is to do those. Did anybody else want to throw in an example of fragmentation? Thank you, Amanda and Steve. Sure. I was just going to say that. Oh, Peter and then Mary Alice. Oh, uh, oh go ahead, Peter. I, I was just going to say I've been doing this work for the better part of um, 
you know, 40 years in, in, in different capacities and uh, including serving as a, a high school assistant principal. I even did a, a, a stint in social services uh, and, and was a child protective services caseworker for the Department of Health and Human Services and did 20 years as a, an adult ed and, uh, and family literacy coordinator uh, in one of the school units up here before assuming this role. Um, and um, yeah, gaps in services in rural Maine in particular uh, is, is just a, a, a reality of life. Uh -huh. um, and um, I, I think uh, I, I was in a meeting yesterday with our partner um, agency, partner community-based agency, the Erist County Action Program uh, in um, the new pre-K uh, expansion grants that we've received in each of our uh, member school units. And one of the things that we talked about is succession planning. Um, uh -huh. We always need to have somebody uh, in place to keep initiatives alive and ensure that they remain systemic. And I think that that uh, plays pretty well to what, um, you know, Steve referred to earlier, every time yes. a person leaves, yes. initiatives kind of fall apart. And in my experience, we're more guilty uh, in public schools uh, of not planning for a, a succession um, than, than community-based partners are. Uh, and right. so we, we, we build a lot of positive momentum moving in the right direction. Uh, but then when that key person leaves, um, it, you know, so does the whole systemic nature of, of the initiative that we're undertaking. And, um, and, and that's something that we just need to stop doing because we invest a lot of money, um, locally and, and federal, but we right. don't have a plan for keeping things going. So really, really good point, Peter. Thank you so much. Uh, and I will say that from a first 10 perspective, <clears throat> I mean, fully support your, uh, ideas about succession planning. And the way that I think we can contribute to this <clears throat> is by creating concrete, feasible plans, getting buy-in around those plans and creating structures for implementing them. And then those structures can live on as, as people change roles. That's our uh, contribution to this. Obviously, succession planning is also important, a little bit beyond our our. Uh, uh, I mean, we can encourage that, but um, but but the, it's really through those structures and plans and the buy-in and commitment that we can uh, help address these uh, challenges. Now, Mary, would you prefer that I call you Mary or Mary Alice? Mary Alice, okay. <laughs> but either way is fine. Okay, Mary Alice. <laughs> so um, we don't offer our own pre-K yet. Um, our first provide, our provider of a few years went out of business and now we're working with WCAP um, Head Start and they're doing a great job, but there's really um, a challenge for staffing pre-K programs. I think we're not paying early educators enough and realizing how important that work is. Mm -hmm. uh, we see yeah. that there's a real difference in the success of kids who do attend pre-K and those who mm -hmm. don't. Mm -hmm. um, our, our kindergarten teachers are particularly aware that um, so many of our children, and there's a lot of poverty in RSU 71, arrive bright and shiny on the first day of school, so happy to be there, but already several years behind. Why? Because their parents didn't know that reading to them, talking to them, building the early literacy skills that help them learn how to read and all the other things we mm -hmm. do in school. And so um, resources to help parents become aware of what are the routines and practices that they can use, you know, from the time the kids are born all the way up mm -hmm. through to That's right. prepare them well for, for school. Uh, we see truancy and attendance problems in, in, in our schools, and they're not because kids don't want to be in school. We really aspire to have schools where kids love school and want to come to school. Very often, it's the challenges of the parent population. I buy a lot of alarm clocks to help people create a routine and get into the habit and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. If there's a reason why a child doesn't want to come to school, of course, we want to know about that and address it. But very often with the younger population, it's not the kids, it's it's the parents who could use some more social support and case management systems uh, mm -hmm. to help our educators, help our kids be in school. Those are just a few. Thank you so much, Mary Alice. All really, really important ideas. I think you're going to uh, see that the, the way that this initiative has been designed is really aimed at using schools as hubs to provide those services, 
to connect families to those services. And that is fundamental to a little bit of that secret sauce, that main secret sauce that I referred to uh, before. So there is really an opportunity in this grant program to provide that. I uh, love that you mentioned alarm clocks. Want to welcome my colleague, Maria Catradis, uh, um, uh, who, who has joined us as well. And um, Maria has supported some of our rural communities in um, Michigan and uh, where they also have made some really good practices around alarm clocks in their, in, their, in their bags. And you'll find that there is a component of this also around a community-wide parenting campaign. You will have choice about what that campaign is, but just know that a parenting campaign, uh, by way of preview, that a parenting campaign is part of this work, as well as those other supports that you referred to, Mary Alice. Thank you all so much. These are wonderful, wonderful comments, and you are clearly aware of the kind of fragmentation and gaps that I am referring to. So you've all set the stage very, very well for uh, our, our, our uh, 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 as we move through this uh, discussing about what First Tent is. So in response to this fragmentation, nationally, there are two movements working to address this. The first is uh, really the idea of improving quality at each stage of development and alignment and coordination across the years, and particularly here, bridging the gap between early childhood and early elementary school. This goes by the name of birth through third grade, T3 prenatal through third grade, um, and, and, and again, the focus is on quality at each stage of development and alignment across the years. The second broad movement in the United States that working is working on addressing these challenges in K-12 education goes by the name of community schools. In early childhood, we refer to this as comprehensive services. And there's another term that people use quite a bit is called integrated student supports. And the idea here is to use schools and preschools as hubs to connect families to services. And you see in all the windows, all the different kinds of services, as well as help with basic needs. So this is a vision, a, a representation of a community school. And that is very much baked into this opportunity that the state is providing, um, is providing you. Head Start, by the way, has been doing this since its founding, these kinds of supports. So back in 20, um, so, so we have been studying these two movements and supporting states and communities in implementing these two movements for many years. And I have been uh, uh, deeply involved in that work. And back in 2017, I received a grant from the Heising Simons Foundation to look at communities across the, commu across the United States that were having success implementing both of these two movements. Um, uh, so I talked to national leaders, I interviewed 18 communities, and I focused on the ones on this map, most of which I uh, visited and um, I did extensive site visits at. And uh, in 2019, published a study, All Children Learn and Thrive, Building First 10 Schools and Communities. I included case studies of those communities, as well as this is where I first proposed the first 10 model. And I am going to share that model in brief with you in just a moment. Uh, before I do, I'll mention uh, first 10 is currently uh, implement, being implemented in six states. In Pennsylvania, we have a cluster of communities in South Central Pennsylvania in the York and uh, Lancaster areas, uh, where uh, those are counties. Um, where, and those are both urban and rural uh, communities. In Rhode Island, we began with the transition to kindergarten. We've supported 12 communities, uh, three of which are implementing our full first 10 model. In Alabama, we began with one urban and one rural uh, uh, community, and we're now expanding, adding another 19 or 20 uh, uh, communities throughout the state uh, over the next few months. And um, we've also helped design Alabama's statewide transition to kindergarten toolkit. And um, those, uh, uh, so a lot of our work, as you'll see, does uh, include the transition to kindergarten. In Michigan, we've uh, launched the six communities uh, this past year. Uh, they are uh, going very well. As I mentioned before, a number of those are uh, rural, and uh, Maria may be able to speak to some of their experiences. And we, um, we're adding another six uh, this spring. 
We have two longstanding urban communities in Massachusetts. Um, we're, and now we are very excited to build on our previous engagement in Maine and add six here. I will mention, and we're very excited about this, that in addition to these state initiatives, state and community initiatives, we have been funded by the Kellogg Foundation to create a first 10 network. And this is an opportunity for our communities, leaders in all of our communities, leaders of, of First 10 efforts, to come together once a month in a, in a webinar to share experiences. And Maine has been very, uh, your state leaders have been very active in that. I think they've uh, learned from communities around the state and, uh, I mean, around the country and in different states as they've shaped this initiative. So we're excited about that peer-to-peer community to community learning. Uh, excuse me, one moment. <clears throat> so here's the model in a nutshell. We begin with a commitment to educational and racial equity and the whole child. We summarize that in the expression, all children learn and thrive. By all children, we aim to eliminate disparities by income, by race and other cultural factors, and by learn and thrive, we have a whole child notion in mind that includes health and mental health outcomes, social emotional learning outcomes, and academic and cognitive outcomes. We then create a partnership in a, in, a, in a community. That partnership includes the school district and elementary schools in particular. And in this case, it's going to be a single elementary school. And it also includes um, our community organizations, particularly our early childhood centers, Head Starts and community-based preschools can be church preschools, anybody who teaches young children or uh, takes care of and teaches young children and our families. And the idea of this collaboration is that we're all interdependent and through our collaboration, we all get better at what we do. We're all able to have more success. We then implement three broad strategies and what I will say about these three broad strategies is that they will be familiar to you. What I think makes First 10 distinctive is that we're implementing these three broad strategies across the early childhood elementary school continuum as part of a coherent plan and very much drawing on the evidence-based practices of exemplar First 10 communities. So uh, that is what I think makes First 10 distinctive. So the first um, broad strategy is to collaborate to improve teaching and learning. This could be collaboration among home visitors or among community-based centers, um, uh, but it always includes a comprehensive transition to kindergarten plan. And that transition to kindergarten plan includes not only supports for children and families, which are very important, and we have lots of great ideas and a lot of innovation throughout our network around really nice supports that we can provide to children and families throughout the transition. But in addition to that, we bring together Head Start, community-based pre-K, district pre-K, and district kindergarten teachers for joint professional learning sometimes including first grade as well. And so that joint professional learning piece we have found to be really quite powerful, very strong in terms of knitting the uh, knitting together the early childhood and uh, school district personnel and um, programming. So that is a key piece of this and a little bit of a signature initiative. We always find that when we do that, a little bit of magic happens in that the kindergarten teachers are like, oh my gosh, this was so productive. I can't believe we haven't been always doing this. And our Head Start and pre-K teachers feel the exact same way and are very glad to be collaborating so that all the knowledge and experience that they have of children is being shared with kindergarten teachers and, um, and that we're connecting and learning from each other. So we find that very powerful. And just to put a little data, a lot of you are representing uh, school districts and um, uh, SAUs and um, a little bit of data behind this big, nice academic rigorous study, a thousand children, 250 schools. The more transition to K practices that our preschool and pre-K teachers do, this is really a gift to our kindergarten teachers. Go ask any of your kindergarten teachers 
and I know you don't need to. Um, uh, do they appreciate these skills or behaviors among their children at the beginning of the year? And you will, as you know, get a resounding, resounding yes. Greater frustration tolerance, better social skills, fewer conduct problems, et cetera. So this is exactly what we're after. Again, big, nice, rigorous research study. An even bigger rigorous uh, research study, 992 schools, 17,000 children. The more transition uh, to kindergarten practices our kindergarten teachers do and our elementary schools do at the beginning of the year, lo and behold, better academic skills at the end of the kindergarten year. This is a powerful one-two punch, right? We start off kindergarten stronger, we end the kindergarten stronger. This is a gift to our first grade teachers, but more importantly, it's a gift to our children and their families, right? Because this is the rest of their education careers right there, right? Very, very uh, powerful research. And that's one reason why we focus on the transition to kindergarten. The second broad strategy is to coordinate comprehensive services. This is about improving referral systems. This is about what we were talking about with Mary Alice, uh, creating those connections uh, through a community school. Um, uh, connecting families to health and social service agencies, and uh, a strategy we've had a lot of success with uh, in our first 10 partnerships is to create school connected play and learn groups. And so this is uh, an option for you. It is uh, not required, but um, we have had a lot of success uh, taking the tried and true play and learn group model. Head Start calls them socializations. You you know, may have done these with your own children, uh, something similar in libraries, uh, story times, and we make a few important tweaks. We bring together our caregivers and our children. We do developmentally appropriate activities. We sing, we dance, we read interactively. We uh, do crafts and art and maybe some cooking. We build trusting relationships between our facilitators and those families. We always integrate some caregiver learning. I'll tell you more about that. And we implement these as a series rather than a drop-in in order better to improve our odds of really changing adult behavior. And then we emphasize three kinds of connections among peers, so family to family. Those are very important. They've been proven in the research. Those that social capital, those peer connections, very important for mental health, support, connecting uh, to services, et cetera. We emphasize in all of our uh, school connected play and learns, connecting families to health and social services, very consistent with the community school model, just pushing it early, pushing it, connecting those families even earlier. I We do understand we work in a lot of rural communities. We can only, there, there's all, not always a lot of services available, but we try to connect to uh, all the ones that we uh, have uh, that are available. And then we want to bridge the gap with schools early, right? So we'll have a kindergarten teacher, an elementary school principal, join the, the uh, join a play and learn. We are so happy to see you here. These are wonderful activities. Let me read you a story. Uh, keep up doing all these great developmentally appropriate activities. A great way to uh, get your children ready for school. And by the way, kindergarten registration starts in March. So um the uh, so anyway, we have had a lot of success with those. Those you'll see a virtual. We um, are now back to doing them uh, in person. And then our third broad strategy is to deepen partnerships with families in culturally responsive ways. This is about elevating family voice, creating engagement and partnership structures. Uh, this is about um, uh, uh, outreach to culturally specific groups, uh, working uh, with uh, churches or faith-based organizations. And then we here have um, always include a parenting campaign, as I mentioned before. So if you already have a parenting campaign in your community, then our job as a first 10 partnership is to amplify that campaign, is to use our partnership to deepen the implementation of that campaign. If you don't have one, the uh, state has several to recommend to you. And um, we will support whichever one your community chooses. So there are different ways of doing a parenting campaign. 
I'm going to give you one example of one that we often use in our communities. It's called the basics. These are five evidence-based uh, parenting principles, maximize love, manage stress, talk, sing, and point, count, group, and compare, explore through movement and play, and read and discuss stories. For each, there's a four-minute video, diverse families, very family-friendly, uh, short, uh, four minutes. And um, there's a uh, texting service that goes line, along with it. There's tip sheets, refrigerator magnets, et cetera. Uh, but this is just an example of what we mean by getting the whole community involved and saturating the community with these messages. You may choose a different campaign, but this, this is where the First 10 partnership can support connecting to all these organizations. And I know in some rural communities, it may not be this many organizations, but everybody that we're, you know, to, to connect with everybody to get on the same page, uh, sing from the same hymnal and promote these uh, messages. Um, to mix a bunch of metaphors at once. Um, and um, the, you know, you can get the arts communities uh, involved as well. Uh, so um, now we have a new partnership in town. We have implementing three broad uh, strategies and it's important that we lead strategically and continuously improve. Here, we, um, we, have, a very, we have a very focused plan. Uh, we don't spend months and months developing that plan. We rely on your expertise in your community to look at work currently underway, to map your assets, to look at your needs, and to uh, relatively quickly develop a plan that we then break into work groups to implement. And each plan has implementation benchmarks, which helps us monitor our progress. We tend to meet uh, every three weeks, so this is important uh, in terms of thinking about the expectations in your community. We'll meet every three weeks for an hour with the whole team to develop the plan. And then depending on the community and the size, we'll either keep meeting with just that one team or we may divide into two work groups and meet with each of them every three weeks for an hour. And I'll also, uh, we can talk about who rep who's on those teams uh, when uh, in just a moment. So that's the first 10 framework. And we um, uh, uh, that's the model with some very concrete examples of what we do under these strategies to give you a sense of the work. Why don't I pause for a moment there? Let's see if you have any questions just about the model. And then we'll talk about this opportunity. Do school systems need to hire a coordinator to help facilitate this work? Well, what a great question. When I talked about that uh, main secret sauce, um, uh, uh, I, it's been a priority of Leanne's, I think, as long as I've known her, um, uh, to build in that support. So we don't, our answer to that is um, in other states is not always an affirmative uh, yes, but in Maine, the answer is a, 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 a yes. There are funds, I'm extraordinarily happy to say, uh, for you to, uh, for the partnership to hire uh, what was called a first 10 um, community school outreach coordinator a first 10 community school outreach coordinator uh, and to manage, to be the liaison for this work, but also to support families and do some of those connecting activities. And we've spelled out uh, exactly what that role is in the RFP. Or RFA, sorry, in the RFA. Thanks. Any other questions about the model? All right, let's get into brass tacks. Um, okay, so this is Maine's three-year pilot project. So here we are talking about that first 10 community school outreach coordinator, okay? So uh, you will receive funds uh, and you see the amounts here year one, year two, and year three. Um, uh, in order to hire the coordinator, but these amounts also include funding for some of the activities. 
It might be stipends for that joint professional learning that I talked about. Okay, so bringing together Head Start pre-K K teachers um, on an even playing field to collaborate. And one of the ways we make that an even playing field is that we take whatever the kindergarten teachers make for after school professional learning and we pay everybody that same rate. So whether you're Head Start or community-based preschool, everybody gets the same hourly rate for those if, if these are happening after school. They don't have to happen after school, but they often do as a way to bring the teachers together. Uh, so that could be one use for the extra funds. Another use is I talked about those school connected play and learns. And so paying for the facilitators, paying for the books that every family brings home after each one, paying for the crafts, um, uh, uh, activities that families can do at home. So those are uh, other, you know, relatively small, but, but nice expenses. Um, and uh, perhaps some supports for, for your parenting campaign, whether it's a texting service, right? Or some of the collateral, some of the color copies of um, tip sheets and uh, flyers, uh, posters for your schools and all your, your, your WIC office, your, uh, all your social service agencies, nice color posters. They help remind not only our families about these opportunities, but also our our our. our uh, uh, frontline workers to support these messages. So, um, uh, and you'll see it it goes down over the years. And so the state is really looking for you to build capacity and to make this sustainable. That's another bit of the main secret sauce here is um, they want your community to have some commitment to this position and these activities. And so you see the uh, numbers dropping over the three years. Um, in order uh, uh, with the expectation that your community is seeing the value of these and, and making up that difference. Uh, and I'll let Leanne speak more to that. And then the third piece is the uh, uh, Department of Ed support, support. We're very excited here. Maine is also gonna be hiring statewide uh, someone to support the work in this. We will provide support. My team and I will provide the support to your communities, but we'll be working alongside a state person to also be building that capacity um, and connecting with state agencies, uh, being a liaison, but also building the capacity to support you through technical assistance. So we think these are really, really uh, nice features of this. Um, let's go back. I'll uh, I'll just quickly uh, show the next two slides and then Leanne, you can speak more to this one. Um, I'll just say the grant is going to have two competitive priorities. Everybody can apply, but there's a competitive priority for rural communities and those who have economic need. And then we also consider readiness. And by readiness, we really are interested in district buy-in and some history of collaboration. I'll just say from my perspective, if you have history of collaboration, great. That's great, but it's 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 um I wouldn't call it a non-negotiable. The non-negotiable is district buy-in. You give me district buy-in, and we'll bring the the early childhood uh, uh, programs will come to the table, and we'll have we can may have an effective partnership. Um, so if I have senior leadership that says we really want to do this, we can do it. It's all the better, of course, if you have some history of collaboration. It sounds like many of you do. So with that, I'll go back to this slide and, and uh, turn it over to Leanne. Thanks, David. You did a great job, really, summarizing a lot of the pieces. So I, I would just add a couple of um, caveats to what David shared. In terms of the, the funding um, for the position David explained really well that you know one of our um, strong desires is that we're supporting communities in getting first 10 models off the ground, but we also want them to be able to st sustain them over time beyond the life of grant funding that gets projects underway. So one of the things that we'll work on over this three-year period is helping you think about how can you find um, the funding to maintain the work. Um, and some, some of that might come from resources that you have at the school level, but it might also come from community partners who are willing to work together with you to help support the position and some of the activities over time. 
Um, that DOE support position that David spoke about is also something that we see as really integral. Um, David's team is marvelous at their outreach, at their support. Um, having worked with them in our first iteration around First 10, um, I can say that communities were really well supported, um, but it's also nice to have someone in our department who is available um, and learning along with you in this process, because our, our other big hope is that over time, we will grow this notion of community schools across our state. Some of you may be aware that the department does have a, a community school um, statute, as well as um, a small pot of funding for community school work. Currently, that supports four schools in the state. Um, I know that we are hopeful to expand that out as well. Um, this is a really good opportunity for us to um, pilot a particular type of community school model um, that we see as really important to bridging the time in the first 10 years of children's lives. Um, while this pilot is happening, there's also another pilot that will be kicking off very soon called First For Me. That's being run out of the Office of Child and Family Services. It's focused more squarely on the period of time from birth to school entry. So, um, and it's also based not in the school, although schools are asked to be a partner in the work, but it's based in a community um, service organization, probably a CAP agency will be the, the lead for it. That RFP is actually out currently and will be um, scored in the not too distant future. We are going to share the evaluator for the first 10 pilot with the first for me pilot because we think that will be a really nice opportunity to study the two models and learn from them. So that's an exciting piece um, of the work. And um, the last piece I'll just offer is that in the time since we first started the work, back, back when we started it, one thing that Maine did that was kind of, I think, kind of a cool step was that we created a, a first and state team um, that's made up of folks from our Department of Ed and our Office of Child and Family Services because we felt like we needed to learn more about this work and, and the model and how could we support it. And even when the pandemic was going on, we kept meeting as a group and really trying to learn and immerse ourselves so that when we got to the point where we had some resources to say, okay, let's get started again, um, we would be in a better position to support. And so that team is really excited as well um, to be able to, to offer some guidance along the way as needed. Okay. That's a very exciting piece. I just want to say from our perspective that the main first 10 state team kept meeting uh, during the pandemic. And, and really, you know, we also heard from er if that earlier initiative, they really listened to those communities and their experiences. So you're the beneficiaries of Ma uh, in Maine of a state team that's been very thoughtful about this. And I know my team that's on this call is, is sitting there thinking, oh, wow. Uh, this is this is exciting that there's that state level coordination happening at the same level at the local coordination. What, one other piece I'll just mention really quickly, David, too, that I found super helpful, and I know you touched on it earlier, and that is the uh, first 10 network that EDC has started mm -hmm. that's connecting first 10 um, partnerships from across the country. And you know, members of our state team have had the great fortune of being able to be a part of that this year as it's been um, unfolding. And it's been wonderful for us, both to see what's going on in local level partnerships, but also making connections with colleagues. The thing that I also notice is the ability for the local communities to be able to connect with one another. Um, there's always time in those, um, sessions on a monthly basis for that to happen, as well as learn about innovative ideas that communities are employing. So um, just a really nice network connection that doesn't take a ton of your time, but it has so much value in it. So, and that will, I believe, David, be open to the communities. Oh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. As a, open to all the piece. 
Yeah. Uh, absolutely, uh, uh, Leanne, open to all participating communities. So we have about, I know, Mary Alice, that you need to run. Uh, thank you so much. We, you know, if you have any questions, Mary Alice, I'm available. Um, uh, ha you know, ha ha happy uh, uh, to, to talk. If there are any follow up questions. Thank you so much. This was really valuable and very exciting. Thanks. Great, great. pleasure to meet you. For, for everyone else, we have a few minutes. Any questions either for Leanne or for me, Peter? Leanne, how soon will this recording be available? Because I really need to get this out to our tri district sure. uh, leadership team, and I and I want to uh, I want to approach Arista County Action Program. I think this is just a fantastic way to build upon our our pre K expansion. I think our pre K expansion would be just one small part of this. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. with with you talking April or 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 May or May or June uh, for an yeah. RFA, so uh, our, I right. want to get people's wheels yep. spinning. Yeah, so I'll be able to turn the um, recording around fairly quickly, Peter. It usually takes you know a little bit to, for it to download, and then we have to convert it up and put it on our YouTube channel. So right. I usually tell people give us twenty four to forty eight hours for for that. But then, and because Monday is a holiday um, for us in state government, it may be Tuesday before I can send it out to you, depending on when I finally get it back from YouTube. Um, but I'll get it out as quickly as I can so that you've got that. But you'll have it by next week. That's not a problem. And I'll send the slides, too, um, from Excellent. David at the same time. Yeah. Um, one other thing it makes me think that I want to want to mention, David um, touched on this just really briefly, saying that, you know, our intention here initially is to um, work with SAUs to pick. Um, so some we know some of our SAUs just have one elementary school. That's it. Then we know we've got some that have a couple, probably smaller elementary schools that all are drawing on the same catchment area of social services, right? Um, and then we have some SAUs that are really big. We have one on the call today, I will say. Um, you know, Steve's SAU is quite large. Um, and you may have multiple um, elementary schools. We want to keep this at a scale that's manageable um, for what we can provide support in, in the pilot. Um, so we're gonna ask that- This is W1. Whoops. <laughs> we're gonna ask that SAUs select one of their schools as the starting point for the work in the pilot. If you have a couple of smaller elementary schools in your SAU that share the same um, social service providers, then it may be possible for both of those schools to be part of the pilot together and might even be able to share that coordinator position. But we are very cognizant that what we don't want to see is an SAU trying to share that coordinator position across multiple elementary schools that are serving a huge population and it just will become really unwieldy for the person to be able to try to to do that role well initially. So we're trying to, to keep that at a scale that is manageable, that we can really help support as you're getting this work off the ground. And that doesn't mean that you couldn't start to expand that out over time. You know, that obviously is a, is a terrific goal. Um, we just wanna make sure that the support we can provide you <laughs> is manageable. Um, so, so Leanne, are you talking about, uh, I'm sorry, I think someone else had a question. So I'm going to hold my question so that individual can ask theirs. Oh, Leanne, I just had a quick question. Is this, do you see the coordinator position being a full time position? We um, do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Leanne, the, 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 the one school, maybe two schools, um, are, are we expected um, to maintain? Our, our focus on the one school for the entire three years, or can, um, you know, year one, we focus on one school, build our infrastructure, uh, get our lessons learned, um, you know, have our strategies in place and then extend to maybe a second and then and then a third in, in years two, two and three. Yeah. And, and my dilemma is that I work for three school units and I think all of them are gonna wanna be part of this. <laughs> Yeah. And when we look at the total population of all three, it's it's really 
a medium sized elementary school population. Right, uh, right. So, so I think Peter, that that would be a really good conversation probably for us to have, like what's manageable and is it possible for one coordinator in your situation to manage those three? Sites, okay, right. Um, okay. Or does it make sense to start with one of them, get that underway? I mean, our, I guess our vision initially with the pilot has been, we really want that one site that starts that we're gonna follow and support for three years because we wanna okay. see that get well established. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean though that, you know, if you decide that some of you wanna bring some of your other schools in, that we can't figure out how to do that, but we may not have the funding to help support it. You may have to commit the funding to it um, to broaden that out more quickly. Right. But, you know, we're not opposed to thinking with you, being good thought partners and trying to figure out how to yeah. make that work. No, and, and, and you always have been, and I've always appreciated that. So, um, but I am starting to see more of you than I see of my wife, Leanne. So we have to stop <laughs> meeting like this. <laughs> yeah. Virtual. I don't virtual know, Peter. Have it's a way. The, it's the nighttime, e late night emails. <laughs> um, at a certain point. Oh, there. You're back, Leanne. You froze for a moment. Yeah, sorry. A little frozen there for a moment. No worries. No worries. So, um, any last questions? Uh, if not, um, Maria, if you wouldn't mind, we just have a minute, but um, M Maria works in a very rural community in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, so uh, I used to say that, the, I, I guess I would just say that, that Rudyard in Upper Peninsula, Michigan is as rural as any community I've worked with in, in, in Maine. You used to, you know, they, they can compete with you. Let's just say that way. So, um, and they are presenting tomorrow at our first 10 network meeting. We're having a network meeting focused on welcome to kindergarten activities. And Maria, maybe if you could just share um, quickly uh, a little bit about kind of how they've been working on addressing transportation and being very inclusive. Yes, yeah, so their community covers their catchment area for the school covers about 300 square miles. So they have a, a huge uh, distance to cover. Um, and one of their uh, pre-K programs, the Head Start program, is actually uh, located quite far away from the school building. Um, so they've been uh, trying to find ways to cover transportation for um, Head Start participants to come to the school for um, different activities. Um, and they're uh, really working on uh, how to integrate um, the teachers from Head Start um, and the parents and the students uh, in all of the activities that are happening at the school building. Um, and so um, they, they'll be sharing tomorrow during the webinar and I, I really encourage you to join it if you can. Um, but they, um, one of the things that they're thinking through is how to also offer um, at the, some of these activities at the Head Start location so that um, they can, um, uh, you know, the parents can go to something that's closer to them uh, and still have it be a school connected play and learn or a kindergarten roundup or whatever other activity they're, they're planning. So they're, they're thinking through a lot of um, different aspects. Thank you so much, Maria. I just wanted to give you a little taste of um, how our, you know, some of our rural communities are working on addressing these uh, challenges. So that was perfect, Maria. Thank you. Uh, so um, again, I'm available if you have follow-up questions. Uh, thank you all so much for all the good, uh, the great questions and the great observations. Uh, it, uh, a pleasure talking with you today, and we encourage you to apply. We're excited to be working, uh, 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 supporting the communities in Maine. Leanne, it's my understanding that there's other main schools that have already started with this initiative. Would it be possible to have a meeting time with them to see how they're doing it or even to get that information from you? Um, I'm more than happy, Amanda. So on our first 10 web page um, that we have for the department, I sent the link in the announcement that went out in the newsroom to that. You'll see a map that lists and shows the 13 that were originally um, involved in the work. I'm also, so that's one place to look. Um, I can also, if you just send me an email, 
connect you if you're interested with a couple of them that I think have continued to engage in the work over time. I can't say that all 13 of them have been able to do that between turnover of staff during the pandemic um, in particular has been one big challenge that some of them experienced in keeping the model going. And that's why we're sort of want to jumpstart and get going again, right? Um, but I'm happy to put you in touch with a couple of them, including in, in our office right now, our distinguished educator, Sue Gallant, who's from the Old Orchard Beat School System. They were one of those 13 and they have continued in um, with the work um, as best they can. And I know she'd be more than happy to speak with anyone as well um, about, the, about the effort. Amanda, I would just say from our perspective, uh, we were thrilled to work with those first main communities. It was uh, an early initiative. It was actually designed as an initiative where those communities were adding preschool slots. It was it was really a pre-K expansion first, and we added this on. And um, the they those communities received a lot less support. Than, the, than this initiative will provide. They did not get the community base, the community school outreach coordinator. They did not get the implementation, not as much in terms of implementation funds, and they got a lot less of our support. So we just met with them three times over a year. So it was a lot lighter touch initiative. You'll get a lot more support. So just keep that in mind. I think that's really important. But Sue has a, Sue Gallant has a really, led the work for Old Orchard Beach. And I think she would be an excellent person to talk to. I think she has a very good understanding of, of what First 10 uh, is. Just from my perspective, just wanted to throw that in. Yep, thank you. Thank you all. Um, pleasure to meet with you and uh, happy to answer any additional questions. Leanne, thank you so much. You're welcome, David. Thank you and your team. Um, I'll get the recording and the slides out. And as David said, if you have questions um, leading up to when we issue the RFA, more than happy to engage in conversations and answer. Um, when we get into the RFA window, then unfortunately I can't respond in the same way. But um, that's why we're doing it on the front end because we want people to be able to ask. Great. Thanks all, bye-bye.